the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. This was a destination I had always hoped to reach one day, as not only did it figure in some research I did for a book I was writing, but it was filled with so many of Hollywood's early pioneers. Founded in 1889, it is one of the oldest cemeteries in Los Angeles. Originally a hundred acres, which later on sold off large tracts of land to Paramount Pictures and RKO Studios. As a matter of fact, if you stand in the center lane entrance of the cemetery, you can see the Hollywood sign up on the mountain, and if you make an about face, you can see the Paramount Water Tower on the other side of the wall, which is where Paramount Studios is. It's kind of creepy if you think about it. One direction, Hollywood sign. The other way, studio. In between, the dead. As a boy, I was always in love with the movies. My boyhood heroes were people like Abbott and Costello, the Marx Brothers, horror film stars Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney Jr., Bela Lugosi, the list goes on. But what I was most interested in were the mysteries surrounding silent film stars William Desmond Taylor and Virginia Rapay. Two of Hollywood's biggest scandals in the 1920s, one immediately following the other. Virginia Rapay would not be known today at all if it had not been for the scandal that involved silent screen legend Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. She had minor roles in a handful of films, and her name only became famous because she had the misfortune to die after attending a wild party at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, hosted by Arbuckle's friends Lowell Sherman and Fred Fishback, who would later change his name after the scandal to Fred Hibbard. Arbuckle, who started out with unknowns like Charlie Chaplin, Mabel Norman, who would later be involved in the William Desmond Taylor scandal, had just signed a million dollar film deal with Paramount Studios. 14 million in today's money. And to celebrate, he and some friends took a trip to San Francisco over the Labor Day weekend. By Monday, his career would be over. Wild rumors began immediately and William Randolph Hearst's newspapers saw to it. They would print every torrid detail of the event, true or not. The more sensational the lie, the quicker Hearst's papers would print it. Maude Delmont, a known Hollywood madam and blackmail artist herself, had attended the party as a guest of Lowell Sherman and brought Virginia Rapay along. Delmont would later lie to police and tell them that Arbuckle had sexually assaulted Rapay. Arbuckle was arrested and District Attorney Matthew Brady saw this as his ticket to becoming the next governor of California. He attacked Arbuckle with every outrageous lie and rumor as fact and the only person who could truly exonerate Arbuckle was Rapay herself, and unfortunately, she was dead. So the money-hungry press and Hollywood vultures began to circle. Paramount immediately backed away from Arbuckle, and movie houses across the country began dropping his films from the hatred stirred up by the press. After three trials, it came out that Delmont was a liar, telling police and anyone who would listen that Arbuckle had been crazy and sexually obsessed with Rapay and took advantage of her at the party, exaggerating that he had performed despicable acts on her. The truth of the matter was, Delmont had been recently with Rapay during an illegal abortion, which resulted in Rapay's bladder being ruptured. That and along with the heavy consumption of illegal alcohol at the party, Virginia Rapay went into convulsions. Hotel doctors were summoned thinking she was just extremely drunk. She was given pills and morphine in hopes that she would sleep it off. Rapay's death was the perfect catalyst to every journalist's dream. Starlet dies in sex scandal with film legend. The kind of story that was good for everyone except for Fatty Arbuckle. 
After three trials, Arbuckle was finally acquitted in six minutes, with the jury foreman stating, Acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel a great injustice has been done him. We feel also that it was our plain duty to give him this exoneration under the evidence, for there was not the slightest proof adduced to connect him in any way with the commission of a crime. He was manly throughout the case, told a straightforward story on the witness stand, which we all believed. The happening at the hotel was an unfortunate affair for which Arbuckle, so the evidence shows, was in no way responsible. We wish him success and hope that the American people will take the judgment of this jury who have sat listening for 31 days to evidence that Roscoe Arbuckle is entirely innocent and free from all blame. Sadly, it was not enough for the bloodthirsty readers of Hearst's newspapers. They continued printing lies and rumors without any regard for the truth. Hearst's motto was, when the lie is bigger than the truth, print the lie. This was truly a tragic event, and those in power saw it nothing more than a financial opportunity. Arbuckle was shunned in Hollywood, and in the years that followed, he only worked on a few films. His friend, silent film star Buster Keaton, reached out to help him. Arbuckle wrote the story for a Keaton short called Daydreams in 1922. He also allegedly co-directed scenes for Keaton's film Sherlock Jr. in 1924. Eventually, Arbuckle worked as a director under the alias of William Goodrich. His father's full name was William Goodrich Arbuckle. Buster Keaton suggested that Arbuckle became a director under the alias of Will Be Good. The pun being too obvious, Arbuckle adopted the more formal pseudonym William Goodrich. In 1932, Arbuckle signed a contract with Warner Brothers to star under his own name in a series of six two-reel comedies to be filmed at the Vitagraph Studios in Brooklyn. These six short films constitute the only recordings of his voice. Silent film actors Lionel Stander and Shemp Howard of Three Stooges fame also appeared in the films. On June 28, 1933, Arbuckle had finished filming the last of the two reelers, four which had already been released. The next day, he signed a contract with Warners to star in a feature-length film. That night, he went out with friends to celebrate his first wedding anniversary and the new Warner contract. He's reported to have said, this is the best day of my life. He suffered a heart attack that night and died in his sleep. He was 46. The same gossip-hungry readers that had called for every salacious detail in the Arbuckle scandal were also the same people who cried Hollywood was out of control, and thus emerged the era of the Hayes Code, Hollywood's weak attempt to police itself that would three decades later result in the Motion Picture Ratings Code. The creation of the Hayes Code was more for show than application. Nothing really changed at all. The power brokers just paid out bigger amounts of hush money, kept local police taken care of, and always played ball with Hearst newspapers. Interesting to know that Lowell Sherman, who instigated the party, never personally suffered any career loss due to the scandal, and he was the one who brought Maude Delmont along. Perhaps he knew how to keep her quiet. It also gives thought to the idea that she most likely went to police and press because she couldn't convince Arbuckle to pony up some cash, especially with the knowledge of Arbuckle's million-dollar paycheck from Paramount. The bizarre ironies of the secondary players in the Arbuckle repay tragedy, Lowell Sherman and Fred Fishback were that. Lowell Sherman's brush with oddness doesn't end there. His maternal grandmother shared the stage with Edwin Booth, brother to John Wilkes Booth, assassin to President Lincoln. And later he himself shared the stage with actress Nance O'Neill, 
who was more than personal friends with the legendary hatchet murderer, Lizzie Borden. While Fred Fishback got his start with Thomas Entz, who would himself later on die under very mysterious circumstances, rumored to be murdered by William Randolph Hearst himself aboard Hearst's yacht while being mistaken for Charlie Chaplin. Today you can find Virginia Rapay's grave at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. It is a very unassuming headstone, usually littered with pennies and trinkets of those who make the journey to experience the unsolved mysteries of old Hollywood. <laughs>